it's estimated that one in 10 men will struggle with erectile dysfunction or ED at some point during their lives. ED affects about 10% of men per decade of life. For example, 40% of men around age 40 will experience some form of erectile dysfunction. And by age 70, that number jumps all the way up to around 70%. This is a big deal about a small thing. We will be going deeper into this important topic and discuss what can be done to help prevent this and what you can do if ED's already got you down. We're gonna get started in 10 seconds. Let's go. Hey, I'm Dr. Grant. Let's get started with your greater life right now. Today, we are going to be discussing a topic that can often be embarrassing for men, but it's a really serious health concern and can often be a sign of more sinister health conditions. It's estimated that about 30 million men in the United States alone have some form of erectile dysfunction, and worldwide it's projected that 322 million men will have ED by the year 2025. And that's up from 152 million back in 1995. I couldn't get it up last night. Do you mean sexually? No, I mean for the big game against Michigan State. Of course sexually! It's important that we differentiate here between the occasional erectile difficulties, which many men experience due to factors such as stress, fatigue, or excessive alcohol consumption, and true ED, which is a recurrent problem that hinders sexual activity or satisfaction. While the process of achieving an erection might seem simple, it's a complex interplay of psychological, neurological, vascular, and endocrine factors. The penis needs an adequate blood flow to become erect, and it needs the pressure in the blood vessels to be high enough to maintain that erection. Therefore, anything that interferes with the nervous system or blood circulation could potentially cause ED. To make sure that we're all on an equal playing field, before we get started, I want to begin today with a review of the anatomy and physiology of the male reproductive system. If anything is dysfunctional, it's important that we understand the normal function so we can fix the problem. The male reproductive system is largely outside of the body with the external components including the penis, which can be divided into three separate sections, not that we want to divide the penis, but three separate sections including the root, the shaft, the glands, or the head. Despite popular belief and broken egos, according to a 2020 study, the average erect penis length is 5.16 inches. The scrotum is a loose bag of skin below the penis that houses the testicles and controls the temperature to optimize sperm development. The internal structures of the male reproductive system include the testes, epididymis, vas deferens, seminal vesicles, prostate, copper's glands, and the urethra. The epididymis is a long coiled tube on the back of each testicle. Immature sperm leave the testicle and mature in the epididymis. The vas deferens is a tube lined with smooth muscle that transports sperm from the epididymis to the urethra. The seminal vesicles are two little sacs that attach to the vas deferens. The secretion of the seminal vesicles makes up 80% of ejaculate. The prostate is rested below the bladder in front of the rectum and should be about the size of a walnut. The prostate is responsible for the production of seminal fluid. The copper glands are pea-sized glands on the sides of the urethra below the prostate. The slippery secretion of the copper glands helps to lubricate and neutralize the urethra for safe transport of sperm out of the body. What's incredible about the innate intelligence of the body in regard to reproduction is when looking at sperm under a microscope, they appear disorganized and kind of chaotic. But in the presence of a female egg, they are uniform and oriented towards that egg. 
It's like a magnetic attraction on a cellular level, truly incredible. It's important to note here that the reproductive system is, is tied very closely to the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the genitourinary systems. We have been conditioned in our society to look at the individual parts and systems of the body, but we often fail to recognize the interdependency of one body system on another. Addressing the symptoms of a condition can often cause us to miss the big picture of global dysfunction. As I've heard it said, if one part of your life is in chaos, your life is in chaos. Hey, Peter, you want a little something to put in that orange juice? What? Why? It's 9 a.m. Well, I figured you'd like to start your day with a stiff one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now that the ninth grade review of sex ed is over, mine is putting a condom on a banana, let's talk about the physiology of an erection. The process of tumescence or engorgement of erectile tissue begins with the nervous system. Sexual stimulation, which can include thoughts, visual stimuli, smell, touch, and sound, will inhibit the sympathetic or fight or flight part of the nervous system and stimulate the parasympathetic or rest, digest, and heal part of the nervous system. This will cause relaxation of smooth muscle in the arteries, increasing blood flow, and will simultaneously cause relaxation of the spongy tissue in the penis called the corpora cavernosa, increasing the space available for the blood to enter. This process will increase blood flow by 20 to 40 times. And as that pressure and size of the penis increases, venous outflow is occluded, keeping blood somewhat trapped in the penis, which helps maintain the erection. We are forgetting about two really important facts in regard to sexual health and reproduction. Number one, if childbirth was the responsibility of men, we would have gone extinct as a species centuries ago. So thank you to women everywhere. And number two, sex feels amazing. We are innately designed to desire sex. The pudendal nerve is primarily responsible for transmission of pleasure signals to the cerebellum and the ventral tegmental portions of the brain, which are responsible for male orgasm. During arousal and after orgasm, there is a cascade of hormones. Dopamine associated with pleasure and reward. Oxytocin, often dubbed the love hormone, is released during physical touch and orgasm, which promotes bonding and feelings of closeness. Endorphins are natural painkillers that can elicit feelings of euphoria and prolactin levels rise post-orgasm, which are associated with sexual satiety and are responsible for de-arousal. All right, now is the time to perk up. We're gonna discuss the common causes of ED. There are both physical and psychological causes of erectile dysfunction. First, let's talk about the physical causes cardiovascular disease, type 1 and 2 diabetes, neurological disorders, and hormonal imbalance. Let's discuss each one of these in detail. The leading physical cause of ED is cardiovascular disease. The connection between the two lies in the dysfunction of the endothelial tissue that lines the arteries throughout the entire body. This endothelial dysfunction will impact vasodilation, which is paramount in achieving an erection. The correlation between ED and heart disease is so strong that some cardiologists propose that a man with ED and no diagnosed cardiovascular disease should be assumed a cardiac or vascular patient until proven otherwise. Drugs used in the treatment of cardiovascular disease including hypertensive drugs and statins used to lower cholesterol levels are also associated with erectile dysfunction. Men with type 1 or type 2 diabetes are three and a half times more likely to have trouble getting and keeping an erection than those without diabetes. Insulin is a hormone that helps to transport glucose into cells so it can be used for energy production. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition where the immune system destroys the insulin secreting beta cells of the pancreas. So artificial insulin is necessary for survival. In type two diabetes, 
there's plenty of insulin being produced, but the insulin glucose combination has difficulty penetrating the cell walls to allow for glucose to be used as energy. This insulin resistant type of diabetes is caused by a lack of physical activity, poor diet, and obesity. Type 2 diabetes is a reversible condition. There are many factors that link ED and diabetes, one of which is individuals with diabetes are also at an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and that leads us right back down the path of endothelial cell dysfunction in arteries affecting vasodilation. Uncontrolled diabetes can lead to neuropathy, which can impact the erectile response. Medications commonly prescribed for diabetes can also cause ED. Type 2 diabetes, in particular, has shown to significantly impact testosterone levels. We're gonna get into the importance of testosterone and its impact on ED momentarily. Certain neurological disorders are associated with higher rates of erectile dysfunction, including multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and patients that have suffered a stroke. These neurological disorders can all lead to ED, but for very different reasons. MS, can impair neurosignaling necessary for an erection. Up to 70% of men with MS will experience some sort of sexual dysfunction. Parkinson's disease leads to death of nerve cells in the substantia nigra in the midbrain. These cells are responsible for the production of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Dopamine activates the cells that will produce the love hormone oxytocin Oxytocin plays a role in the production of testosterone, and it impacts male ejaculation. So it really is a cascade that impacts multiple aspects of sexual health. Stroke patients may have no sexual health impairment, moderate impairment, or severe impairment. The level of impairment is ultimately determined by the part of the brain that is impacted by the stroke. Conversely, studies suggest that men who have ED are at a greatly heightened risk for stroke. Low testosterone levels can not only have a negative impact on libido, but can directly cause ED. One third of men that have ED also have low testosterone. Testosterone levels tend to drop in the third and fourth decade of life. Some of the common causes of low testosterone levels include testicular damage, cancer, and obesity. The largest and most overlooked cause of low testosterone is exposure to estrogenic compounds. So these estrogenic compounds are essentially chemicals that mimic estrogen in our body and they will fill estrogen receptors. Not only can they negatively impact testosterone levels, but they have been linked to reproductive cancers, obesity, infertility, and depression. There are several forms of estrogenic compounds. The most potent naturally occurring estrogenics are aerosolized marijuana, aerosolized lavender, soy, and flax. The full list of artificial chemical estrogenics is huge, but here are some of the most common sources. Bisphenol A or BPA, and bisphenol S or BPS in plastics. So even if you have a plastic that is labeled BPA free, it is still going to contain BPS. My personal goal is to minimize the amount of food and beverage I consume out of plastics, especially if it's hot, because that heat is going to increase the amount of leaching of plastic into the food or beverage you're consuming. To minimize your exposure, you can also use a sauna on a regular basis. So the sauna is going to help your body sweat out the BPA and the BPS that have been stored in your body from plastics. Conventionally raised red meat, beef specifically, is often fed grain that commonly contains estrogenic mold. I personally love beef. I'm a huge red meat beef connoisseur. Not a big pork guy. love my beef though. So I try my best to only consume grass-fed, grass-finished beef. 
So I do this to try to avoid that estrogenic mold from conventionally raised beef. Parabens are estrogenic compounds that are commonly found in cosmetics and several other industries. It's almost impossible to completely avoid paraben exposure. So you read the label on the back of your shampoo, back of your soap, back of your shaving cream, and if you see ingredients you don't know, Google the ingredients, right? And that's a great way to begin to understand what those chemicals are that you're putting in and on your body. The last and most common way we are all exposed to estrogenics is through drinking water that is processed through water treatment facilities. A common form of birth control, ethyl, ethanol estradiol, or EE2, is commonly found in public drinking water. When this birth control drug is consumed by women, it ends up in their urine and it gets flushed down the toilet and then goes to a water treatment plant. Water treatment plants don't have the means to remove pharmaceuticals from our water. So if you are consuming or bathing in public water, you are absorbing EE2, a potent estrogenic. So in essence, we are almost all on birth control. So a great way to minimize your EE2 exposure is by filtering your water with activated charcoal filters, which can help to minimize the presence of EE2 in your water. I personally use Berkey filters. So before I move on from physical causes of ED to psychological causes of ED, I just wanna let you know we have put a tremendous number of resources in the description link. So please check that out. And if you have questions, comment below. We will stay engaged and do our best to answer your questions. So I wanna transition on though to discuss the most common psychological causes of ED. And those are stress, anxiety, and depression. Wow, Peter, you're up. That's not what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> These issues all point back to the role of the nervous system and its importance in relation to sexual health. If the fight or fight response is not properly modulated, it can cause several health concerns, including ED. No man can run for his life from a bear and get an erection at the same time. I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it again! I'm gonna kill the bear. Say it again! I'm gonna kill the bear! We just aren't wired that way. I believe the most common psychological cause of ED is excessive pornography use. While there is conflicting evidence about the use of porn and its direct cause of ED, there is no argument in the scientific literature about the regular exposure to pornography and its negative impact on sexual appetite, making it more challenging to get an erection and more challenging to achieve an orgasm with your partner. The use of porn will also lead to image problems of what you and your partner should look like, which will also lead to a less satisfying sex life. There are also lifestyle factors that can lead to self-inflicted ED. Tobacco use, alcoholism, and drug abuse are some of the more common causes of self-inflicted ED. A healthy sex life is part of a healthy life. If ED's got you down, keep your head up. Things just getting harder and harder. If you are inflicting yourself with ED by using tobacco products, consuming excessive alcohol, or using other street drugs, if you simply discontinue the use of these and give your body the chance to heal, things should be looking up in no time. Limiting your exposure to estrogenic compounds and begin working out multiple times per week can help to improve testosterone levels naturally. There are also supplements available that have been shown to increase free male testosterone, including D3, fenugreek, horny goat weed, and ashwagandha. There are many other supplements that have shown promise, but my personal favorite is from a company called Genius Brand, and the specific supplement is called Genius Test. And this is not a paid shout out to that company, I just like that supplement. Implementation of stress management techniques, including daily prayer, meditation, may be helpful in improving testosterone levels by decreasing stress levels. How about now? Is this doing anything for you? No. 
Hmm. Well, what if I show you my tattoo? Nothing. Well, you got a dead rat in your pants, mister. If you are a regular consumer of pornography, I'd suggest cutting it out completely for at least 90 to 120 days, if not eliminating it altogether. The stress hormone cortisol produced by the adrenal glands will inhibit testosterone levels. So think about stressful situations like work, your spouse, kids, finances, your health. All of these stresses can lead to chronic elevation of cortisol, which will create chronic inhibition of testosterone. The good news is your body was designed to adapt to stress. It's when your body fails to adapt that breakdown happens. The nervous system is the quarterback for the stress response and for erections. If your nervous system is focused on keeping you alive, it won't have the adaptive margin for an erection. Chiropractic care improves the adaptive capacity to stress. There is promising research that suggests chiropractic care is effective at helping with ED. So chiropractic care might be able to help straighten out more than just your spine. If you choose to go down the path of pharmaceutical drugs, the most commonly used type of drug to treat ED is called PDE5 inhibitors. You know, you can take a pill for that. No, no, that's a cheat. You start with the pills, next thing you know, you're putting in hydraulics. A hard on should be gotten legitimately or shouldn't be gotten at all. Hmm. I think Mark Twain said that, didn't he? So PDE5 is an enzyme in the walls of blood vessels, and inhibition of PDE5 will relax blood vessels and increase blood flow. PDE5 inhibitors include Stendra, Levitra, Cialis, and Viagra. And these drugs will all treat the problem, but they fail to correct the root cause of it. And common side effects include visual disturbances, like blindness or blue visions. You might get an erection, but don't know where to put it. Headaches, hearing loss, back pain, and what's known as a priapism or erections that don't go away. Medical doctors may also suggest testosterone replacement therapy, or TRT. And while this will help to increase testosterone levels, this is also a lifelong commitment. So once you start, you can't stop. And there's research that suggests TRT has negative long-term implications for your kidneys. From a medical device standpoint, one of the most commonly used devices are vacuum erection devices, also known as penis pumps. Really classy name there, guys. These seem to show promise of getting an erection for up to 30 minutes in 90% of cases. Ultimately, it's healthy to be horny. The lack of or inability to resolve this feeling is a challenge for millions of men. There are a lot of avenues to go down. I'd recommend starting with the least invasive and progressing to more and more invasive if needed. Develop healthy lifestyle habits, remove toxic garbage from your body and from your mind. And these challenges and these changes might seem hard, but it's much harder to be soft. So I hope this information has literally changed your life for the better. Thank you for watching, and I hope you will join us on our next episode. Cheers to your greater life.